great perfect thank you everyone it's 2 p.m and um we will start because we've got such a busy final session um i'd just like to thank the speakers um and the participants and you all for that last session which i thought was fantastic so open honest um really helpful and and really informative so thank you we've got a a, a, a very exciting session um coming up and uh, i make no apologies for choosing to chair this session when Sujal and I put this day together because really uh, I think it's the, the most exciting of the lot. We've left it till the end because we've got some really, really exciting opportunities to talk about where we will be going with pulmonary fibrosis in the next few years. Um, we've got a talk from Dr. Karanos first about the research strategy for the Brompton Hospital and I know that we've had over 800 um, uh, uh, delegates sign up to this day and, and um, over 500 at any one time, many of which, are, but not exclusively from the Bronx. And I think it's important that we tell you and showcase some of the work we've been doing here. I'm honored that Marlies Vizembeek will be joining us, or is joining us to talk about her, her pioneering work in home monitoring um, and patient reported outcome measures um, in, in interstitial lung disease and fibrosis. We'll hear from Professor Anand Devraj, um, thoracic radiologist, uh, who uh, is going to tell us a little bit more about CT building on the, uh, the introduction we made earlier when we uh, presented our, um, our multidisciplinary team and how we uh, discuss difficult cases. Um, Geasley um, Jenkins is going to dial in from a conference in the States and he's going to talk us through the genetics of ILD and how that might impact outcomes. And I know a lot of people are really interested in this and that's come up in many of the questions which we will be addressing later. And then Dr. Molyneux will talk a little bit about um, some of the emerging clinical trials and the approaches that we may be hopefully uh, seeing in the coming years and and we envisage uh, you, our patients, will benefit from. So um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Vasilis Karanis. He is, um, he in fact was the driving force behind this day when he designed the first patient day, which was for sarcoidosis not long ago. And, and it was off the back of that massive success that we felt we really needed to replicate that for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm personally thankful to him. He's a really good friend of mine, and I'm delighted to welcome him uh, to, to kick off his talk. Thanks, Pete. Hello, everyone. I'm Vasilis Kuranos. Thank you for the very kind invitation, Pete, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I think that in the last um, year, we have been hit by an earthquake called COVID, but this uh, gave us the opportunity to use technology and come closer to you in a way that this hasn't happened before. And um, I think that this is critically important. Um, from my perspective, I'll, I'll take you through some of the things that are happening at the moment in our hospital, uh, both from our clinical team, but also our research team. So um, we have a quite big team working in ILD. Um, uh, and um, uh, with leading Professor Wells, Dr. Enjoni, Professor Jenkins, Dr. Chua, Dr. George, Dr. Molnu, uh, Dr. Kokos, and myself as uh, actually the most junior consultant. And it is an actual privilege to work with them alongside with our radiologists and histopathologists. We all create a very strong multidisciplinary team based on which we are designing research as well. Um, I was interested in this um, uh, uh, website that I, I was uh, asked to look up and see that actually the Royal Brompton Hospital uh, regarding the publication since 2011 is actually the second hospital in, in the world. Um, and Professor Wells is uh, the leading physician in research in ILD. Um, our research is patient focused and consultant led. We have established a weekly research meeting where we discuss all our uh, old and new perspective and retrospective studies. And we're actually discussing our next steps. We also have a very strong research team um, uh, through our um, uh, clinical research facility where uh, clinical trials are taking place. Um, from a clinical perspective, we have um, um, launched a series of studies uh, in both interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis, 
with a name to develop an optimal risk stratification approach to develop optimal multidisciplinary practice in both interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis, as well as some uh, the transformative classification in the field of sarcoidosis and interstitial lung disease. We have managed to develop um, a, a rather large retrospective interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis registry involving all of the patient's clinical characteristics, uh, MDT diagnosis, serial lung function tests, and serial imaging that equips, must, equips us to actually design a lot of our studies. This is obviously in a retrospective matter, manner in the first place. So we have constructed retrospective studies focusing on the risk stratification, as I mentioned above. This is our first key goal, and we are trying to identify patients at high risk to develop progressive fibrotic uh, lung disease, as well as those that are at risk of developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, I will just make a, make a note here with regards to what progressive fibrotic lung disease is, um, although I would imagine that this is part of what you have heard so far. Um, Professor Wells has uh, actually um, developed the disease behavior classification, um, which is now established uh, worldwide. And um, we are talking about patients who, despite conventional treatment, appear to have Prog um, progression of their disease. Recently, um, a, a very large um, randomized controlled trial showed um, a, a benefit from the use of nitendanib in these patients, which we are uh, waiting um, to allow the use of nitendanib um, uh, in the new year. We are also trying, as part of our risk certification, to understand the role of gastroesophageal reflux pulmonary, and the pulmonary vascular component in all patients with pulmonary fibrosis, not only um, the IPF patients, but also the non-IPF group. And we have Dr. Renzoni and Dr. George leading that uh, part. In collaboration with Imperial College and particularly Dr. Simon Walsh, we are looking into uh, identifying the potential role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the risk certification of patients with ILD and sarcoidosis using their available imaging. We're also um, collaborating at a national le uh, level in a study of the role of lung cancer screening in the earlier di diagnosis of ILD. We, we, we have been privileged to be part in uh, preliminary results where actually we found that interstitial lung abnormalities can be identified in approximately 10% of, of the patients who are undergoing lung cancer screening. And that would probably give us um, a strong input in identifying fibrotic lung disease at an earlier stage. The future is to actually develop a prospective similar cohort of interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis patients to actually validate our retrospective findings. We would, we would welcome you to participate and actually ask you uh, for your consent, as well as ask your opinion about the actual uh, design of our studies. Um, and we, we have already been asked to participate in international registries for interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis as part of a worldwide approach in providing real life data. There is a national study that is going to be launched after the use of the nitendanib is now, uh, will be uh, for all patients without IPF um, and progressive fibrotic lung disease and we uh, will be participating in that. The second arm of our um, clinical research is focusing on the multidisciplinary approach and we, we want to establish the uh, the role of the disease behavior classification when reaching an interstitial lung disease diagnosis, and we would like to validate the importance of different level of confidence when diagnosing clinical interstitial lung disease. There are studies that are currently ongoing with regards to these particular questions. We have we have been doing a multidisciplinary study in cardiac sarcoidosis where we are trying to construct and validate our multidisciplinary approach in that particular field in a similar manner. I must uh, um, uh, congratulate Professor Wilson, Professor Desai 
as leading physicians in um, um, uh, in, in 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 performing a transformative CT classification of pulmonary sarcoidosis, followed by an international Delphi study that um, has been completed now. Uh, we are planning to further explore the sarcoidosis phenotypes, integrating possible genetic interactions. Um, I must say that um, I, I haven't added that, but we must also congratulate Dr. Enjoni, who is actually doing a lot of work in identifying genetic associations uh, in patients with connective tissue disease in this associated interstitial lung disease, um, as well as um, those with progressive fibrotic lung disease in general. We must never forget our clinical trials, and um, Dr. Phil Molyneux is uh, our uh, um, clinical research facility director who is uh, leading our clinical trials. We have a healthy vol volunteer study to better understand um, pulmonary fibrosis and use that as control group, and we have at least four clinical trials, five clinical trials, sorry, running in, in uh, pulmonary fibrosis and IPF in particular. Um, we have just started a study in sarcoidosis associated pulmonary hypertension, and um, we will soon be able to start a study in chronic pulmonary sarcoidosis too. So I would like to ask you to participate, to get involved, because together we are making a difference, and um, I'm open for any questions you may have. Vasilis, that was a wonderful oversight. Thank you very much. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes. I might just ask you to clarify to, to our patients what, what you mean when you say retrospective and what does prospective mean, um, just, just to lay, make that more apparent. So um, in a retrospective manner, it means that for all the patients that have attended our clinics, um, we have applied to... Um, a, a government uh, committee called MHRA to uh, to actually inform them that we are planning to review the results of their of their tests that they have had so far, and this is um, tests that have already been performed. All the studies designed using this type of data are considered to be retrospective, um, and prospective studies are studies that we are planning with a specific. Um, a question and an aim, and we're asking patients to consent. Um, nowadays, we're actually asking patients to help us with the design of the studies itself. So as a patient a representative or, or our advocate may participate in the study design um, in, a, in, a, in, in the preliminary phase. Perfect, thank you very much, Vasilis. That's wonderful, thank you. And you'll stick around till the end, I hope, for the questions and answers at the end, that's perfect. Marlies, if I can bring you in for your talk. Uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Marlies Wiesenbeek. Again, a friend of the Brompton, a friend of me personally. I'm really grateful that you've taken the time out to join us. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. And it's a real pleasure um, to present in this session. So I'm, I'm very happy to be part of your um, great day. And I would like to share a bit of our experiences with home monitoring and also about patient reported outcomes. Um, I'm a pulmonologist and head of our ILD center in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. These are my disclosures. I collaborate a lot with pharma, but I never accept personal money from them. If we um, treat you and in the care for patients with pulmonary fibrosis, what we aim for is to prolong your life, so make it as long as possible, but also as good as possible, according to your values and wishes. So if we want to evaluate treatments, we want to know how you function, how you feel, and how you survive. And we have different ways of measuring this. Survival is quite black and white, um, but function and feel can be assessed in different ways. And we call these um, ways outcome measures. And the most traditional outcome measures are physiological outcome measures, such as lung function, your six minute walk test, imaging the CT scans, you have done, but we also ask about symptoms and this can be in clinic, a doctor asking, but it can also be, and you, you're maybe familiar with that, with um, scoring this on forms and answering questions about it. And the same applies on health related quality of life. So how does the disease and how does the treatment impact your life? Usually this is done by pretty long questionnaires with not all um, questions being um, equally relevant for you. 
Um, and also we evaluate experiences with care. And these upper measures are usually done in hospitals and these lower ones that we call patient reported outcomes because they're directly reported by you. But nowadays with new techniques, we obviously can manage and collaborate with you to also collect these physiological outcomes, these measurements at home. And then we call it patient reported and patient recorded outcomes. And I think you recognize this. We live in the quantify yourself era. And some of you might have step counters or watches that can measure all sorts of things, your um, heartbeat or you have a pulse oximeter, but there's many more tools, even advanced uh, sensors that you can wear. And you can also measure pulmonary function at home. And we call that a part of home monitoring, but you also heard this terminology of telemedicine and e-health. And just to clarify, telemedicine is anything on a distance. So if the doctor calls you up, you're doing telemedicine together. E-health is anything that we do with communication technologies. So two centers discussing in a virtual meeting your CT scan, that's also called e-health. And home monitoring is actually that we monitor you at home so that we um, monitor your disease behavior at home. And what we use, mostly use in pulmonary fibrosis at home is home spirometry. Is an example of one of the patients in our clinic um, where you measure your home lung function at home, but also the step counters, um, the oxygen measures, so the saturation measures, and obviously also um, tools where you can collect patient reported outcomes, so questionnaires. And I think you should realize that this home monitoring of the lung function started off in the Brompton Hospital. So this is the first important international published paper coming from the Brompton, where you see that in that time it was a spirometer where you had to note down the values and it was collected later. And some of you might have participated in this, where you can see that you can actually measure the disease course and you can also see if things changes in behavior. And for instance, when there is a, an infection or an exacerbation. So this was an important study. And now these tools have developed much more. And this is an example of a system that we used. We developed this together with patients so that it's very friendly to use and patients are very enthusiastic about it. And what you see on the right side is that you can keep track of all these dots are measurements on different days of the lung function. So you can see this is an example of a patient more stable. This is an example where you can see the decline in lung function. These can also be used to keep track of symptoms, of side effects. We can put alarms on this so that the nurses are contacted when there are changes. Um, and so this has many advantages in our opinion for care. And in daily care, what we learn and what we hear from patients is that um, we can have much more insights in the disease course. We have more measurements. It's not from one visit to another, but it's daily or usually weekly that people record something. It gives access to care, it bridges distances. It is real-time transmission of data. We can help patients manage side effects. And also for researchers had many advantages because you often have to go in for measurements and these can be reduced. And also if we have more measurements, we need less patients for trials. We can um, watch your safety very well. We can use the data for registries. And we heard about that, uh, the importance of registries in the previous talk, and we can monitor symptoms. So in this way, doctors and patients can really collaborate. You have to come less to the hospital and you can become partners in care. But obviously there are also disadvantages or potential disadvantages who will pay for the system and that will depend on the setting if it's a trial or not and how governments have arranged this. Is it fit for all? Some patients have less access to Wi-Fi or less uh, technical SEFI. It might be an effort to do these um, uh, measurements at home it might also, may also be confronting that you do something related to your disease every week. Patients also say, I will miss the human touch of the doctor if I you know, deal with this online. There might be technical issues, not um, connecting to the Wi-Fi, not transmitting data. You have to make good rules on who sees these data and where are they stored. And what is often a problem is that the patient is ready, but the doctor is not ready. But nevertheless, um, there are still many advantages for tailored care and to have this partnership. But obviously we also wondered what it would have for effect on patients. So what we did in our center and in three other centers in the Netherlands, we randomized, which means you draw a patient who says, I want to participate, gets a, draws a number and either they get standard care or they get the home monitoring added to that. 
We compared after 24 weeks how the outcomes were and we looked at their health related quality of life. And what we found is that home monitors seem to have a positive effect on the psychological well being. That's the big blue bar that comes up in the middle. But more important, the patient experiences were very positive. 95% would recommend it to others. 89% said they have better insights in the disease cause. 88% said they felt more secure. And they said there was lower threshold communication. In the COVID pandemic, we upskilled this uh, system to continue our care for patients. And even when in the summer, the patients were allowed to come in again, 98% of the patients wanted to continue using the app and their satisfaction was very high with an eight out of a score of 10. We used this to replace 50% of our visits. And here you see an example of me doing a virtual consultation with one of the patients. We also asked 300 ILD doctors around the world about this home monitoring because I th we thought if patients want it but doctors don't want it, it's also no use to further develop and implement this. And what you see here, the pale blue ones is what they're currently doing and the dark blue ones is what they would like to monitor. So you see that about 70, 80% of the doctors really wants to implement home monitoring as well. And this has also led now to a new initiative, an international patient-centered registry for different forms of pulmonary fibrosis. And if you want to know more about it, you can scan the QR code with your phone um, on the bottom. And I think they will also put the link in the chat. Um, and this trial is also gonna run in the UK and the Brompton is gonna participate with Cambridge and Oxford and Liverpool as well. And Dr. Molly Noe will know more about it if you have questions. And the aim of this registry is to get more insight in the long-term changes in the lung functions measured with home spirometry. Also to see if it is feasible to have this patient-led and patient-filled registry to get even more detailed data to learn about diseases and also to validate better and more easy outcome measures that are more perceived as more relevant by you. And how would I see this in future? Um, in future, you would come in, we won't know much about you. That's the person on the left, very blank. And this is one of my last slides. You will then have your blood drawn. We will look at the genetics, for instance, your microbiome. So what bacteria do you have and um, biomarkers? We can also learn about your environment. What exposures do you have? We can even track um, if there is air pollution in the area where you live, how much activity you do you have? You can record measures yourself, but you can also put in your values and choices, what you would prefer, and that will create an individual patient profile. You could then tailor your treatments and you can integrate the data and outcomes and see if that's satisfactory. If not, you can adjust the treatment, you can recollect these data and feed it again in it, but you can also collect all these data together from different patients and use these data to learn more and to get even better treatments for the personal patients. So I think integrating all these different levels of data will learn us more about diseases, but will also help us tailor the treatments um, to your situation. So in conclusion, patient reported and patient recorded outcomes by home monitoring are very important to tailor treatments. They will help us to get more insight in diseases and advance the fields. Um, home monitoring empowers patients to really be part of this and become a partner, not only in the care, but also in the research. But I do have to acknowledge that we need more research. We have to see how we really integrate this into the care and the research, but the re uh, possibilities are very promising. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions later on. Marlies, that was amazing wonderful talk really a glimpse into the future and I, I just love the fact you're integrating patients into your your um, your research strategy which has to be the way for us to move things forward um, really amazing if you're able to wait until the end with us for the will. that will be fantastic I'd be really grateful and thank you so much for running perfectly to time a true professional so thank you um, and I'd, I'd like to introduce next professor Anand Devraj um, who you briefly uh, met earlier when he was being grilled uh, at the MDT. Um, uh, and now he's going to be able to present on, on his own terms uh, about CT uh, in lung fibrosis. So, so thank you, Anand. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, and uh, yes, I'm going to uh, go over some very basic aspects of what is a CT scan and um, why do we do it in lung fibrosis. Uh, I'll recap some of the things that we said this morning. It's worth just um, 
recapping what an X-ray is, a chest X-ray, because actually CT scans involve X-rays as well um, that many of you may not know, but it's the same type of ionizing radiation. So in an X-ray, uh, as is seen in this example here, what happens is usually the patient is standing up. Uh, X-ray tube passes X-ray uh, beams from typically behind the patient for a chest X-ray. And then the uh, X-ray passes through the chest and is what we call attenuated or stopped in its tracks or partially stopped in its tracks. And some of the beams carry on and then go to what used to be a, a, a film, but is now a, a digital uh, plate where an image is captured. That image basically reflects density because the, the denser something is, the more the X-ray beam will be attenuated or partially stopped. And that will lead to less X-rays reaching the X-ray film. Whereas on the other hand, areas which are not very dense, such as the lungs as it happens, because it contains gas or air, which is not a very dense material. Other areas, the X-ray beam will pass through without being attenuated or stopped and will go and reach the, uh, uh, the image plate and will create a different uh, uh, appearance on that. So that's really what an X-ray is, is doing. And if we um, see on an X-ray, what we often find, and this is the same for CT, is that bones will look white, very dense, bones are the densest uh, thing that we have in our thorax. Uh, and uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the lungs which contain air will be black. And in between, you will see uh, sh shades of gray or white, uh, shades of black, which represent the disease. And we saw some examples this morning of fibrosis, which uh, looked either gray or white. So what I'll do is show you an x-ray, just to recap, which um, some of you may have seen before. Now, everyone who ends up with a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis will almost certainly have had a chest x-ray as the first test before they get to a CT scan. And this is a good tool. It's a good sort of catch-all tool, but it's, it's not very sensitive. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that in early or milder forms of the disease, the chest x-ray can often be normal. It's only when the disease is more advanced that the chest x-ray is able to detect pulmonary fibrosis. The CT, on the other hand, is much more sensitive and can pick up disease at a much earlier stage. So this is a normal chest x-ray where the uh, black areas on, well, let me start with the, the shadow in the middle of the picture is the heart and the black areas either side are the lungs. And there are lots of other white areas which represent the ribs, which of course is bone. And um, this is an example of somebody with a severe lung disease, it's not fibrosis, but you can see what happens in lung diseases is that the density changes, the lungs are no longer filled with as much air. And so as a result, the X-ray goes from looking black to, to more white. And this is a very much a similar principle that we use in CT, but as I showed you this morning, CT is also able to not just detect fibrosis, but also characterize the type of fibrosis that we're dealing with because there are lots of clues that radiologists look for uh, in terms of interpreting the CT scans. So a CT scan, as uh, I'm sure many of you have had, involves uh, delivering the x-rays instead of the patient standing up lying on a table. And the table moves through the um, x-ray machine, which is that little donut that you can see on the slide. And what happens is that the um, inside that uh, donut, what is happening is that x-rays are being delivered in, uh, in, in a bit like a fab, uh, a, a beam of multiple x-rays, which then rotate around the patient to give you a 360 degree appearance of the lungs. And uh, what happens is uh, that spiral that you can see here is the x-ray machine going round and round and round, which is that whirring sound that you may hear when you're in the CT scanner as the table moves. So it's delivering those x-rays um, around to get a, a, a 360, a 3D, if you like, picture of the lungs, not just a 2D picture. So uh, 
we sh I showed you some CTs this morning uh, in the MDT. Uh, this is a, a normal CT scan, just to recap. The um, uh, areas of black are the normal lung. You can see some white areas there, which in the middle is the heart, but also within the lungs, those white areas represent normal blood vessels. And what we're looking for in lung, if to detect lung fibrosis is that those areas of normal black lung will instead show uh, areas of gray or white. And here is an example. This is uh, what we call an NSIP, which is a type of lung disease, interstitial lung disease, that some patients with diseases like scleroderma or rheumatoid arthritis may develop. And you can see there that the lung has become gray. Um, uh, uh, and, and the CT also gives you a, a, not just a diagnostic tool, but it also gives you an assessment of severity because you can see how much of the lung has been affected by the disease. And in this case, most of that lung on the left, uh, which remember um, is, is in, in medical terminology is inverted. So the left is uh, actually the right of the screen as you're looking at it. Um, uh, is occupied by gray lung, and that is uh, this disease which we call NSIP. Uh, whereas on the right, the disease which is on the left of your screen, the, uh, the, the lung is less infiltrated. And the other thing I should say is that when we look at CT scans, what we're actually looking at is a cross section. So it's like a, a slice has been taken as you're lying on the table through your chest. So um, at the top of the screen would be the front of your chest. At the back of the screen, at the bottom of the screen, would be the back of your chest where you could see the, the vertebra, uh, and on either side, you've got the lungs and the ribs. And the image is created as if you're looking through uh, uh, the patient from the bottom of the table. So you're looking at the feet of the from the feet of the patient upwards, uh, uh, and you're taking a slice through. It. That's what CT scans allow us to do. So another case this time of UIP, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where you can see that the black lungs have been replaced by what we call reticulation, which are these little linear uh, white lines and what I referred to earlier this morning, traction bronchiectasis. Another thing that CT can sometimes do, it's not just diagnosis, it's not just assessing severity, but there is a role um, in some patients for monitoring uh, as time goes on. So in this case, you can see here that where I've circled that blue that blue area, the lung has become grayer on the right-hand side of the screen in 2019 compared to the left-hand side. So it can also demonstrate progression of disease or uh, be used in conjunction with lung function as a way of monitoring uh, treatment or, or decline or improvement or progression. The final thing I just want to um, come to is, uh, and this is another example of, of progression, which I won't dwell on. The final thing I want to come to that patients may want to know about is radiation. Um, before I go into how much radiation is involved in a chest X-ray or a CT scan, it's worth just remembering that we are all in our day-to-day -day lives exposed to radiation. Our annual dose of living uh, in the UK is about 2.7 millisieverts. That's the unit that we use to describe dose. And actually that can vary depending on where you live based on the background um, environment. For example, in the USA or in Cornwall, the, uh, as it happens, the radiation dose is higher by uh, taking a transatlantic flight, you're exposed to a very small amount of radiation. So this is a normal part of our day-to-day -day lives. And it's whenever considering how much radiation is involved in a CT or chest X, it's always worth putting it into context uh, by, saying how well how does it compare to what you're exposed to anyway so how does it compare well a chest x-ray typically has a very low radiation dose uh, 0.014 ct head 1.4 and a ct chest 6.6 .6. so these are all comparable to either one or two years worth of annual background radiation anyway and it's also worth remembering that whenever a ct scan is done the, the very slight risks, which are actually very negligible at such small doses, is far, far outweighed uh, by the benefits of making a, a diagnosis. And um, CT has played an absolutely essential role for, for many patients, I'm sure you'll be aware of, in making the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, I'll stop there, Pete.
And that's perfect. Really nice um, explanation of, of the value of CT. We are so reliant on CT. And in fact, during the probably during the COVID pandemic, where it's been challenging to arrange lung function tests because of the fact it, it can be aerosol generating and may be related to, maybe more challenging to perform, CT has taken on perhaps a more prominent role. And perhaps uh, in the question and answer, we can talk about how CT could be automated one day to think about the, the harnessing artificial intelligence. Um, I'm going to bring in Geasley Jenkins, who has managed to transcend time zones and sketchy Wi-Fi to join us. Um, uh, I hope I've seen him uh, just a moment ago. There he is. Perfect. And Geasley um, is going to talk through uh, really a topic that when I look at the questions and answers, the questions have come in from the patients. This makes up maybe 20 to 30 percent of the questions that have come in. It's all about the genetics in, in, in ILD. So Geasley, I, I'll, over to you. Thank you. So yeah, uh, greetings from uh, sunny New Hampshire, uh, where I am at the moment. So I'm going to talk about genetics uh, in the diagnosis and management of interstitial lung disease. So uh, just a brief overview of uh, genetics. Uh, so DNA provides the genetic code. Broadly, when we think about genetics, we're thinking about DNA. And it's organized uh, into chromosomes. And you can see those on the screen here. There are 23 chromosomes. Uh, and they are each each is a pair, uh, and within each chromosome there are regions of DNA which are called genes. So not all DNA is a gene, but there are specific regions which are genes, and they they are within the chromosome. And your DNA genes and chromosomes are determined at birth, and they don't change throughout life. There are two chromosomes each containing one copy of a gene in almost all cells in the body. There are some cells, red blood cells, which don't have any genes because they're produced uh, centrally. But almost all cells have, uh, have genes. And you get one copy from each parent. And then the genes encode proteins. And it's important to remember that not all changes in genes lead to changes in protein. And if you have a a change in a gene which doesn't have any what we call coding effect, then it's usually not a problem. So in terms of pulmonary fibrosis, we think about genetics and pulmonary fibrosis in two broad categories. So the first category, the most obvious category, is what we call familial pulmonary fibrosis. And this is fibrosis which is inherited uh, from, a, from a parent. Uh, and so if a patient with pulmonary fibrosis has got a first degree family member, oops, I don't know why the slides are going ahead. Apologies. There'll, there'll, there'll be a, a delay when you, when you click. So you, when, once you've clicked, the slide will move a little after you've clicked. Sorry about that. So the, um, if you have pulmonary fibrosis and a first degree family member who has also got pulmonary fibrosis, then by definition, uh, you have got familial pulmonary fibrosis. And the first degree family member would be a, a parent, a sibling, or a child. And it doesn't matter what type of uh, pulmonary fibrosis it is. If, you, if, uh, if your sibling or your parent has had chronic HP and your diagnosis is IPF, the genetic element is considered strong enough for it to be the, the same disease. So we still call that familial pulmonary fibrosis. The challenging part is that only 25% of people with familial pulmonary fibrosis have got an identifiable causal variant, which means that 75% of people with familial pulmonary fibrosis will not have the, or we won't be able to identify the underlying genetic cause. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is by definition idiopathic without a known cause, but it is a, a largely genetic disease. And we know that many of the genes that, that play a causal role, and the current estimate for the genetic effect is thought to be about 15%. So the, the interaction with the environment is crucial, but we know there's a genetic combination. Uh, and in terms of the genetics of pulmonary fibrosis, we know that the, the, some of the genes, so over here we have what we call the rare variants, and that's surfactant protein C, surfactant protein A2, and telomere-related genes, TERT, TERC, RETAIL1, and PALM. And these are responsible for familial pulmonary fibrosis largely. 
Over here, we have what we call common variants, most notably MUC5B, and also some common variants in uh, telomere-related genes, DPP9, ATP11A, and about 16 in total. And though, though these each have a small effect, so they increase a person's risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis, but they're not directly causal. And when we think about familial pulmonary fibrosis, about 6% of people in the BTS registry were described as having a first degree relative. But in the US, estimates of, and genetic studies suggest at least 10 to 15% of people with IPF have some family history of the disease. Screening studies of family members uh, with CT scan have suggested that in asymptomatic individuals, 25% of people will have some evidence of fibrosis on the CT in, a, in, a, in people who had previously thought to be uh, having idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So there's a lot more pulmonary fibrosis which is familiar than previously thought. To. So it's anywhere between about 10 and 25%. And as I said, uh, however, only about 25% of these people will have uh, a gene, an identifiable gene, causing their familial pulmonary fibrosis. So what this means is that if you have a rare causal variant, that variant uh, will lead to the disease. That's what a causal variant is. Uh, however, unfortunately, we don't know how soon the disease will develop or how bad it will be. So it's quite possible that if a causal variant is identified, it won't actually lead to the development of disease until uh, much later in life, and it might not lead to many symptoms. So we can't correlate uh, the cause with the severity. And most of the known variants are linked to premature aging, so telomere-related genes, and they're responsible for at least 23% uh, of the, uh, the, the genes that we've uh, identified in the 100,000 Genome Project. But these variants are useful to know because they help with therapeutic planning because they may impact on how people respond to transplantation and immunosuppressive drugs. And they can also help in terms of risk modification. So making sure that people stay away from some, uh, cigarette smoke and dusty environments. Unfortunately, absence of the variant doesn't mean that you won't get pulmonary fibrosis. And common variants, as I said, are not causal, they're risk factors. So the interaction with other factors is important. Uh, Therefore, most people with these genetic changes will not develop the disease. There are a lot more people with MUC5B minor alleles who do not get pulmonary fibrosis than who do get pulmonary fibrosis. And therefore, causality is very diff difficult to determine. However, understanding common variants may help understand comorbidities. For example, uh, the risk of poor outcomes if you have systemic hypertension with the MUC5B minor allele is different uh, than if you don't. So what does all this mean clinically? Well, doctors need to ask uh, about family history. So we need to know what, 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 uh, whether people have relatives with pulmonary fibrosis. And we need to ask about short telomere syndrome signs, such as blood traits. Is there any evidence of macrocytosis? Hair color, premature graying is a, is a sign of short telomeres and pre-existent liver disease. And then we need to consider genetic testing if any of these, uh, these features are revealed. And then we need to refer for genetic counseling because clearly having genetic tests is uh, not without its, its uh, issues. So who should have genetic testing? I mean, anyone can get genetic testing. You can do ancestry through a variety of online kits, but we only want to screen uh, people for specific genes. And so, as I said, if you have evidence of familial pulmonary fibrosis, then it would be sensible to see if a causal variant could be identified. If people have evidence of specific genetic syndrome, such as short telomere syndrome, then we should look for telomere-related genes. And younger people, specifically children, uh, we tend to refer for genetic testing because the longer-term impacts of immunosuppression and potential transplantation become things that we need to consider. But genes are important even in sporadic disease because IPF is due to a gene environment interaction. And as I said, different genes may implicate different types of IPF, what we call endotypes. 
And understanding the interaction between different genes may help us identify risk of developing IPF in the future using things like polygenic risk scores, which are a research tool which we are, we are investigating in IPF. So just to finish off, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that genes are very important in the development of IPF. And if a patient with IPF has a family member with pulmonary fibrosis, the diagnosis is familial pulmonary fibrosis, regardless of the genetic test results that we find. A positive genetic test doesn't mean that you will get symptomatic disease, but it's likely to increase the risk in some circumstances. And so that needs to be communicated carefully. And likewise, a negative genetic test doesn't mean that you won't get IPF, but clearly, if there is a causal variant which runs through the family and you, you haven't got this, then your risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis is massively reduced. So genetic tests and the results will give us an idea of the type of pulmonary fibrosis that people might have and how it might respond to treatment. Thank you. Easy, great talk. Thank you very much. A complex um, area. Um, really explained in, in simple terminology, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I hope you'll stick around um, for the question and answer in about 10 minutes' time. Um, but I will bring in now um, Dr. Phil Molyneux. He's going to talk about emerging clinical trials and some promising approaches that we can look towards. Thank you, and thanks for the invite to speak. I thought I would uh, try and cover a, a number of things because um, recently there's been a a lot of interest in clinical trials and there's been a number of relatively uh, relatively high profile clinical trials that have either failed or stopped so I was going to try and just give you a brief overview of why that may be but give you some hope as to what still is ongoing. So the standard clinical trial in IPF is uh, is it is, a, is exemplar by the nintedinib study. So this is the study that led to nintedinib getting licensed, and it is a drug versus a sugar tablet, a placebo. So you give patients, you gave patients a drug, you gave some patients a, a sugar tablet. No one knew what they were getting, not the doctors, not the clinicians looking after them. And we followed them up over 52 weeks. And at the end of that, what you're able to plot is this nice graph that shows change in lung volume. So over time, lung volume goes down. And if you're on the sugar tablet, the placebo, your lung volume goes down quicker than if you're on the drug. So the drug works. And I've flipped into bifinidone because both of the studies were exactly the same and they both show the nice, this nice graph. So the drug works. Now, what that means is it's great news for patients. We've got two drugs. We've got a standard of care. So patients that know, now have a, a, a therapy that they should receive when they get a diagnosis of IPF. And that has implications for how you design the next clinical trial because what you now can't do is expect patients to stay off treatment and go on to a placebo and a sugar pill. There are drugs that work for pulmonary fibrosis. So giving patients a sugar pill to try and compare it to a new drug is not appropriate and not right. So when we think about new drugs and how, how they're going to work, you have to think about what happens to the sugar pill arm, the placebo arm. What does the antifibrotic arm look like? And how is your new drug going to improve on this? But it's going to have to lift it up even higher. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the first gains are the easiest and every incremental improvement on here is much tougher. So the bar has been raised uh, much higher for any of the new drugs coming to market because there's already been an improvement with antifibrotic therapy. So when we think about things that and drugs that and trials that may have failed, it's not necessarily that they're, they're a bad drug. It's just that the bar for them to to improve upon uh, ha has been raised. But there's a lot of hope for patients with pulmonary fibrosis and researchers, and I, and I love this uh, this picture because it really it illustrates the number of clinical targets that we have for pulmonary fibrosis senescence so how do cells behave when they get older mitochondria how do the energy uh, cells work and what do they play in fibrosis we've got um, stem cell therapies genetic targets telomeres that Geasley's just mentioned so loads of different things to target um, and I'm going to highlight a few of these and highlight some of the studies that have been ongoing some of the studies that have just stopped and some of the studies that are just starting up 
Um, and for all of those who are posting in the chat about how do you get involved in studies, well, I would hope that your um, the clinicians caring for you would mention them when you see them. But I've got an e email address for our research team at the end of this um, that I'll share again. Um, and you can email in um, and see what options are available. So the first area I'm going to talk about is the autotaxin uh, trial. So autotaxin it, it, it came from a number of studies, but the, the most advanced of these was from Galapagos. And this was work we did here at the Brompton uh, in the early phase study. And they jumped right into a big later phase study called Isabella 1 and 2. Um, and Isabella 1 and 2 looked quite similar to the, the designs from the Nintendo and Perfenidone studies. And, and we had a, a number of patients on it here. But as a number of you will know, unfortunately, that clinical trial has been stopped and it was stopped early. Um, so halfway through the study, the, the, the results were not promising and the study was stopped. And that was a, a massive blow for everybody in the pulmonary fibrosis community because we were quite hopeful that this was going to be a, 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 a new therapy uh, that we could use in combination with our existing antifibrotic therapy. But all is not lost. You know, this was based on, on relatively solid science. Uh, and, and there are other drugs targeting this pathway in fibrosis. Um, so Boehringer are bringing uh, a molecule that uh, works on the autotaxin pathway to market. Um, and those trials will open uh, next year. Um, there is another drug um, which is called an LPA antagonist. This works in the same pathway, just at a slightly different point in the in the cell. And this is from Bristol Myers Squibb. This study is recruiting; it's recruiting well. And importantly, this study is recruiting patients with both IPF and patients with PFILD. Um, the IPF recruitment is almost complete, um, and the PFILD recruitment is ongoing. So the, this pathway is very promising. And although we've had a, a, a rather high-profile failure in the Isabella study, uh, the BMS uh, and the subsequent Boehringer studies, uh, we still have have much hope for. The next study that will be familiar to many is that of the Galectin uh, family. Uh, and this was an interesting study because, uh, again, it was based on, on work we did here at the Brompton, um, uh, looking at how these drugs worked in the lungs. So these are drugs that we delivered to the lung via an inhaler. So it was very uh, appealing to our, our patients who perhaps had side effects, couldn't take tablets, um, and, and going straight into the lung tissue. Um, and again, the study followed a very similar pattern. You see, it's not rocket science designing a lot of these studies to get drugs to market. But this study, again, had a stop. And now it wasn't a complete stop. It wasn't a complete end of story, but the results were not as promising uh, as hoped for. Um, and, and looking at the drug in combination with antifibrotic agents, the sinintedin and profenadine showed that, that it wasn't appropriate to continue the trial on patients who were already on antifibrotics. So the trial rebooted and restarted and is recruiting patients who are off all therapy. So either patients who in the UK are not able to access therapy um, via NICE uh, regulations or have been intolerant of it. Um, so from that perspective, it's an op opportunity for patients who are intolerant of therapy to try inhaled therapy. We have um, upcoming uh, over the next six months, two trials opening um, with intravenous and in, uh, drugs. So these are drugs that are injected either on a weekly, monthly schedule. Um, the first one is the CTGF inhibitor. This is a comes from a company called Fibrogen and they have developed the Zephyrus study. And again, you see a quite similar graph with a placebo um, and, and against the drug, and it shows an improvement in the loss of lung function over time. So the hope is that this intravenous therapy will be successful. The Zephyra study is actively recruiting around the world and opens up in the UK uh, and at the Brompton later this uh, month, actually. Um, so we should be open by the end of uh, the end of November. The next one that we're relatively hopeful for as well is the is the Pentraxin and ProMedia story. This has been going for quite some time, and the drug, again, shows some benefit in the early studies. It lost its way. It lost its home. But Roche have bought it, 
Um, and Roche have now rolled out a new uh, big phase three study um, or called the Starscape study. And that opens uh, in December here at the Brompton and may well be opening uh, RBHT South GSTT uh, as well. I focused mainly on uh, on disease modifying and improving lung function, but you know a lot of people have mentioned cough and other symptoms. We've got a number of studies looking at the symptoms in uh, in IPF and specifically cough. We've got the canal study that's looking at a morphine analog, malbufine. We've got pacify cough that's sponsored and run by the the Bronson, looking at the use of morphine sulfate in in chronic cough. So there are options for people with symptoms um, now. In that whistle stop tour, I'd hopefully get you to believe that it's not all bad news when clinical trials fail because we've improved the, the bar that they're uh, compared to. Um, we'll get incremental improvements over time. There's inhaled therapies, there's IV therapies, and there's lots of new studies opening up over the next uh, 12 months. So please ask the consultant or registrar you see if it's if you'd be appropriate for studies. And if you want to contact the research team directly, our email address is there and I can get them to share it in the chat as well. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. And thank you um, to all the participants um, in that session. If I could ask you just to put your, put your cameras on because there's loads of really interesting questions. We've got hundreds of questions that have come through and I'm going to try and pick a few themes. Um, I might start actually, um, Molly's, I'm fascinated by the home spirometry. So many patients find that a really patient centric approach. When do you think we will be in a position to roll that out as a standard of care for our patients? Yeah, I think we're sort of in the position already. Um, what we have done and uh, in the COVID pandemic really has sped it up. So we're using it in our clinic now in 400 patients and in the Netherlands there is I think an equal amount of patients using it, but the problem is to get it structurally reimbursed. And that is something that insurance companies and governments should take a stand on. Um, and I think still this, this has to be tailored because some patients really don't like home monitoring. Other patients love it because it saves them a lot of travel and gives them access to expert centers where they could otherwise not come. Yeah, I think that's right. I think easily has got a lot of experience of that in Nottingham. And we're doing a number of home spirometry studies here at the Brompton. And I think for centers like ours and, and others where patients um, come from all over, it's, it's a really useful way to avoid travel. Gisley, I want to ask you a question about data monitoring safety committees. Patients um, will invest so much hope in clinical trials and then get really disappointed when the trials are stopped, but they're often done so with really rigorous um, assessment by, by experts. Can you just share some insights of, of what that's like and how that process works? Yeah, so um, basically if you're, if you're serving on a data safety monitoring committee, you're responsibility is to ensure that all people who enter the clinical trial are safe and we have to recognize that if uh, you know if we knew a drug worked we wouldn't need to do a trial and the point to do the clinical trial to see a if it improves outcomes from the disease and b that it doesn't have any unwanted side effects so you have to keep an eye on all of these things so uh, blood test monitoring adverse symptoms and and looking at what happens to the patients during the course of the study and you you get to analyze the uh, numbers in an unblinded way completely independently from the company running the study and if there is a safety signal then there is a duty to stop a study because you cannot justify causing harm in a study so it's it's a it's a it's a big responsibility and people who uh, who serve on these committees recognize that but the, the first duty of the committee is to make sure that patients are not put at undue risk by being in the study. So it's really there to protect patients from any harm that might come as a consequence. And, and when, when the tipping point of harm over benefits is reached by the group, that's, that's where it has to stop. Yeah, it's a, the, the idea is not to make a judgment of whether the drug is working or not. That's the purpose of the clinical trial. The, the, the major uh, consideration is, is the, is the drug safe? Now, if the, if the drug was tolerated and there was no safety signal, it's very likely that, that studies, even if not obviously effective, would be allowed to run their course. But if there's a hint of harm being caused, then the, the duty is to, to terminate the study early. Okay. Alan's going to have to leave, but I want to ask him one quick question before he goes, which is, 
Phil eloquently um, made the point about how difficult it is going to be for us to demonstrate improvement above and beyond standard of care when we bring new drugs to market now. Can you think, or Anna, do you have any information about how CT might, in an artificial intelligence way, help us do that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Pete. So I showed in my talk um, some cases of scans done a few years apart showing uh, disease progression. And uh, as in clinical trials, what you, to try and establish whether the drug is working, what you want to do is to compare two groups. And one way of comparing the two groups at the moment is through lung function. Has one group done better than the other? Uh, people are looking into whether CT can also substitute or be used in addition to lung function. So in other words, is the group that has the drug, does that show less progression? Like the example I showed you compared to the group who are having the placebo. And um, that that's certainly an area of a lot of research and not just in terms of uh, comparing the scans visually, but using automated uh, computer assisted methods because it can be quite challenging to detect those subtle changes by the naked eye and uh, that's why it's ripe potentially for the use for automated methods to, 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 to identify that. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And thank you, Anna. If you need to go, then please do. Um, Phil, question for you. Um, if you were going to um, put all your money into one basket, uh, which is the most hopeful drug that's coming out? Where should we all buy our stock? I mean, I'd have told you to buy Galapagos, but then, you know, I didn't uh, listen so to probably, uh, uh, I, I mean, look, they're all promising and I can't, I can't in all good consciousness say that one study is better than the others. Um, I think there's different modalities that will suit different people. Um, and I, I, from just a delivery perspective and also a target perspective. So I think the one thing that's going to be good is that if one drug doesn't work for you, there'll be another that will. Um, so I think it's not fair to say that one is better than the other. But you, nice, try on, right, nice try on getting me to do that. Beautifully sidestepped. Um, so uh, really a question, Gizzi, that's come up uh, over and over again. And I know this is an area that's close to your heart as as the, the new chair of the Margaret Turner Warwick um, um, Fibrosis Centre which is, we have talked a lot about slowing down fibrosis, um, but we have not yet been able to reverse fibrosis or cure these terrible diseases. How close are we to that? And what is the roadmap? So, yeah, great, great question. How close is, not, well, it's, it's not imminent, unfortunately, but there, there is, I think, a pretty clear roadmap. Um, the, there are ways that we can uh, intervene potentially earlier, as, as Phil has described beautifully, there are a huge number of potential therapeutic targets. Um, so if we can give the right drug to the right patient at the right time, the, the chances we can either prevent progression of disease before it is burdensome, uh, I would call that uh, pr pretty close to a cure. So if you have no symptoms of a disease, and the disease isn't getting worse, that's pretty good. Um, but once you have established fibrosis, which is causing a substantial loss of lung function and substantial symptoms, then the challenge is much harder because that involves tissue engineering. Now, actually, there's some really cool work going on over here in the States, which is really promising from a tissue engineering perspective. Um, so I think there are, there are ways that we can achieve it different ways so as i said starting treatment early um, using some of the new drugs that might be coming uh be available and through tissue engineering i think we will get there it, it's not it's not a it's not a quick journey unfortunately we're not there yet but we, we hope to be uh vasilis who is the the um, the guru of all things sarcoid and um, leads our sarcoid service there's a question specifically for you which is can you talk us through um, the exciting advances that you would see for sarcoidosis research um, in the next few years? Where should we be focusing our attentions and what's the most exciting area from your perspective? Um, I think that at the moment, the focus of the um, uh, clinical trials is to identify a drug <clears throat> that will not be steroid based to actually try to minimize the side effects that most of the sarcoid patients experience. And I think that there is a lot of work to be done and, and, and currently uh, ongoing in, in trying to identify 
um, better screening tools for um, major uh, organ involvement. So uh, involvement of um, uh, organs that could cause life-threatening problems. These two areas, I think, is what we should expect in the next few years. Okay, that's great. Um, any can I can I just ask? There's just one. There's a general sort of theme. Quite a few people have asked, how can they, how can their family members get involved in trials? And I wonder if any of the panel have got um, an answer to that. To say, well, if you are interested in a trial, this is where you go. Yeah. yeah. So I, I showed the email address for the ILD trials team here. So patients can contact us directly. Um, patients can ask their consultants that they see, uh, the registrar that they see in clinic, are, are my suitable for any clinical trials. And the one thing to say is that, unfortunately, not everybody is suitable for every clinical trial. So when you contact us, what will happen, and it's probably useful to know, is that we'll go through your records. We'll see if there's any of these trials suitable for you. Um, and if there are, we'll send you out some information. Um, so we can't always get everybody into a trial, and not every trial is suitable for every patient. Yeah. Um, and so on, a, on a similar vein, I think some people have asked, how can my family members get involved? So I, I guess it's the same route. Yeah, same route. And we've got we've got healthy controls. We've got family member studies where we're, we're sampling. So yeah, uh, the the more the the more the merrier. Thanks, Phil. What I, would say, I, I, I didn't say that. If uh, the nurses complain about all the emails they get now. No, uh, but also this is not something that's unique to the Brompton. Every every centre should be offering research as a matter of course. That is just part of good clinical care. So I wouldn't want patients thinking they need to come to us for research when there are. Set their own centres will be offering research, and, and of course, if there aren't, then we're delighted to help. But um, but it's important that people talk to their own clinicians and consultants about the research opportunities that are available. Uh, Gizzi, there's lots of talk about COVID, and uh, uh, there's a question here, which is, why do some patients get long COVID and a deterioration in their ILD after COVID? And then I'm going to follow up with Marlies to say, do you think that home spirometry has had a role? In, uh, in, in, in detecting uh, deteriorations more quickly and, for example, acute exacerbation. So Geasley first and then Mullies. So, uh, I mean, that's a million dollar question. Why do, why do some people get severe COVID and severe complications following that and, and others don't? So at the current time, we don't know. We suspect it's something to do with uh, initial severity, which is due to a combination of genetic and environmental factors, pretty much like many diseases uh, and the more severe your initial disease the more likely you are uh, to, to get long-term complications uh, and in terms of people with pulmonary fibrosis specifically we feel that unfortunately the uh, the inflammation and alveolar the damage that is caused by uh, the, the virus then triggers a, a, an accelerated repair response which which is why patients with pulmonary fibrosis may get worsening of their disease afterwards Can I continue? <laughs> Please, yes. Yeah, we have several um, experiences already with detecting deteriorations, either acute exacerbations or, for instance, pneumonia or other intercurrent problems. In Germany, there is a trial going on now with home spirometry and detecting acute exacerbations. Um, the fortunate problem is that um, the um, uh, incidence of these acute exacerbations is, is, not, is rare. So you need a lot of patients to detect them. But I think in our last half year, we have detected three by home spirometry. Well, that's very valuable. What we need next is a really effective treatment for acute exacerbation, which of course is an area of unmet need. Yeah, and also if, if you detect them earlier, that maybe treatments are more effective than now if we, uh, we detect them later. But I think that's all areas for research. Perfect. Um, I think I think we're probably in a position to wrap up. We've still got nearly 400 participants, which is incredible seeing as we started this day at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, we've had over 500 individual people join at any one time and probably more family members and carers sitting alongside them. Um, I, I think for, I would just say a, a huge thank you from my perspective, and then I'll pass to Louise and then Sujal to close, uh, which is to say that we've been... Um, struck by the warmth of the of the patients we've been struck by the uh, huge enthusiasm i've been personally so grateful um to louise the whole team um emma's done an incredible job and you all for attending our speakers who've given their talks in with at least 
uh, 30 seconds to go before their presentation time, um, uh, but definitely keeping to time. So we are all really grateful and we really would be grateful for any feedback that you have that will allow us to design this day again, if you think it's helpful uh, in future. Um, Louise, I'll pass to you. Thanks, P. I see. I can see gizfully has got his hand up. Have you got a? Yeah, no. Just I'm trying to answer a question on the on the question and answer, but I can't seem to type it. So I would be happy to answer it, it verbally if that, if that would help. But all people can contact me by email. Yeah. Pardon? Go for yeah. it. Oh yeah. So, no, so uh, uh, one of one of the attendees says, uh, "My father died of IPF, and I have IPF." So. I, by definition, he has familial pulmonary fibrosis, does he get his children genetically tested? So the answer to that is not automatically. What I would recommend is that you get genetically tested. Uh, and then if a causal variant is identified, then genetic counselors can have a discussion with you and your family as to the benefits and negatives about having a genetic test. If, however, you don't have a causal variant identified, there is no benefit to anyone else in your family getting tested. Um, just a quick question on that, Gisley. Are people able to get genetic testing on the NHS? They yet? are now, yes. I don't know. I, well, it's a bit like the nice uh, announcement. So, familiar Next year. is is, ava is available on the test directory. It was added at the last cut, which is great news. So anyone with who, who thinks they have familial pulmonary fibrosis can get to tested through the NHS. Um, but whether that's fully rolled out across the country yet or not, I'm not sure. But it will be. I don't, yeah, I don't think it is, but it will be soon. So, um, yeah, so thank you, Gisley. I think uh, reflections from me on, on the day it's quite easy to feel alone and isolated with, uh, you know, IPF or one of the rarer lung diseases. And one of the benefits of COVID is bringing all these experts and patients online for one day. It's not often that I leave a, a whole day on Zoom with a spring in my step, but I will do today. And I hope that uh, patients and families watching will do too. I think I have felt humbled and lucky to hear uh, from experts, you know, the best experts from around the world, talking with passion and empathy. Um, and yeah, just feel, feel really lucky. And I think uh, love Steve's session and Charlotte's session uh, with patients and carers who talked about, you know, there's no brushing aside how difficult it is to live with PF, but how people remain hopeful and giving practical uh, tips and ways of support. Um, and I thought that was, uh, yeah, really inspiring. I think uh, please find Action PF website. Please go. There's loads of support. There's the videos will be recorded and be available over the next couple of weeks. But there's lots of tools and videos already um, from other speakers. So please go on and our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, just uh, thanks to the whole team. It's uh, you know, working and supporting families affected by PF is a team effort. And so, so it has been today. Uh, and uh, a kudos to AVT as well, who have managed uh, uh, the technical side behind the scenes. So, yeah, that's it from me, I think. Sujal. Uh, what can I say? Wow. Um, it happened. We organised this at the beginning of the year. It's been a great team effort. Um, uh, but it's you know it's been about the patients and i think that's that's the most important thing um thank you to all the speakers all the participants including the attendees who have asked questions intelligent questions important questions and i you know um louise used the word humbled i, I felt very humbled by session three where the patients uh spoke with such um clarity um and honesty, uh, and it was very important to hear uh, everything that was said in that session. Um, and as we said at the beginning of the day, um, this was the first 
of such uh, events um, and we hope we can hold more of these. Uh, we would like to make this a regular thing um, and we hope that you've enjoyed it enough, found it informative enough to join us again because it's very important that we keep speaking to patients and carers and family uh, in this very important field. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.